also have the opportunity later to um, get that video. Um, if you would want that, please uh, send me an email later. I will be happy to share it with you. Um, again, so we're going to start with introduction. And please, um, if you have any question during um, this webinar, feel free to write it in the chat as you've done already before. And um, we will keep all the questions until um, the end of the of the webinar. But um, if you don't want to forget, use the chat and we will for sure uh, pay attention and use that as well. Um, but we definitely used several of your questions that you've sent us before and uh, put it in the webinar itself. So um, yeah, it's going to be a lot of information today. So let's start. So um, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Eden, as I mentioned. I was born in Jerusalem, Israel, and uh, <laughs> I removed the picture of Leipzig and I forgot to put a new one. Um, so you can only imagine how it looks like. <laughs> um, right, so I lived in Jerusalem for 22 years, but uh, I've been living in Leipzig only five years. Uh, you won't do the right math, but I've moved in to, to Leipzig when I was 26. So. Yeah, now you can do the math and how old I am. <laughs> but I've moved here with my husband and um, we basically um, just tried to live here. We didn't have an, a, a big plan on what to do in Leipzig, but um, we even never seen it before. So we said, OK, we can start here and just see how it goes. And if we don't like it, then we would probably just go to find somewhere else. And we never left. So um, you can see also what I what we think about Leipzig. Um, and during COVID, I've found myself just answering a lot of questions of people wanting to move to Germany and Leipzig. And I just had so much fun doing that. And I felt really good doing that just for free, um, you know, having hours on the phone with people um, answering questions. And this is why I decided to open um, Over the OFEC, which is basically a relocation agency um, located in Leipzig and at the moment helping um, people who want to move to Leipzig from outside of Germany. Um, a little bit of what uh, we are offering, basically, um, so, some of them are pre-relocation options, just as the online course or or um, consultancy of just like organizing your thoughts of how to even start. Um, we also offer online German course um, for those who want to start even before moving or even after you're here. Um, I'm also offering city tours to get to know the city either before or after you're here and um, interpretation and document translation options uh, for those who need help with uh, the language and Obviously, after you're here, um, getting to know friends and integrate yourself in the community is also a very important part. And this is why we're offering also community events. Um, so this is about us. And now I'm going to give the stage to Ofri. She's going to explain and tell about herself and um, tell all about what it's like to be a parent in Germany. So I want to thank Ofri again to, that you joined us and the stage is yours. I'm going to stop. Thank you. Sharing. Thank you for having me and for the introduction. Let me just share my screen. OK, can you see it? Yeah. Good. So a little bit about me. I uh, moved to Germany from Israel four and a half years ago with my husband and our dog, who is right next to me, so hopefully he won't be loud. <laughs> um, both our kids were born here. Robin is four and a half and Libby is almost two. And I am an interior designer. I do mostly apartments and office spaces, both uh, larger scale renovations and also home decor. And I have a blog about design and about parenthood and um, recommendations on things to do with the kids. We will talk about it a little bit uh, further. So I know some of the people that um, 
signed up already live in Germany and are just having thoughts on starting a family, but we will start our webinar on what to do even before you relocate here, um, especially with uh, children. So there is the aspect of emotional preparation. Um, it really depends on the child's age. And of course, different ages uh, have different difficulties and struggles. Uh, the younger kids may not even understand what the concept of this transition is. Um, they don't even know what is a country. They've never been on an airplane, maybe. It's a very big transformation for them. And older kids maybe have more uh, social anxiety and um, worrying about what they are leaving behind. So the most important thing um, is to talk to them about it. And if they are younger, then to focus on what they can understand. Um, maybe they've never been to Germany, so they don't know what it's like and what it looks like. So you can talk about um, uh, the weather here as opposed to the weather in your home country. You can uh, show them pictures of your home or their school or the street or the city. Um, explain that we will pack up our things, put everything in boxes, go on an airplane, things that they can picture in their head. Um, of course, encourage them to ask you questions and discuss all the feelings. Um, relocation can be exciting and a very good thing for the entire family, but it can also bring up some more difficult emotions like sadness and fear. And it's very important for us to talk about it with them. Um, if they are very young, they may not even completely understand what they are feeling. So we need to set the example and say, oh, this is very exciting, but I'm afraid because, or I'm sad because we will, I will miss my uh, co-workers or my friends or our family. Um, so really bring those things up into the day-to-day -day conversation. Um, like I said, both my kids were born here, um, but something that I saw other families do that I found to be very, very sweet and helpful was a personal photo album that you can do in different um, free apps and then you can print it. You can add photos of your family and the people that you love in your home country and your home and maybe the kids. Um, daycare and school and add short texts and then maybe a picture of an airplane and pictures of Germany and if you have already pictures of your neighborhood or things that um, the places where you will actually be then to add those and um, it can help with the preparation and I know that even after long after the relocation the kids really love to look through it and it's kind of like um, they can look back on this like as a memory and of course there are many books on the subject and um, these are just a few that I found repeating in different um, groups and online um, but there are many books in many languages and of course you should choose the one in your um, mother tongue and we will talk about that uh, about language in a little bit but um, that's also a very good way to bring up those um, a little bit confusing topics. Um, and on the other side is all the logistical bureaucratical preparations, which can be a lot, especially with kids. Um, even before Ed then approached me to do this webinar together, that was the main tip that I gave people who asked me about relocation. Um, is to hire the services of a relocation consultant because that's what we did and um, it really, really helped us. Um, it took a lot of uh, stress out of the equation and um, 
helped us to better organize all the different forms and papers that we need to bring, uh, make all the appointments in advance and just make this transition a little bit easier. So that is something that I really recommend. Um, so once you're here and you are registered in Germany, it doesn't, doesn't matter where in Germany, um, uh, each child, uh, each family is um, eligible for child benefits. Um, the amount changed a few months ago and now it is 250 euros per child per month. Um, very straightforward, you fill out the forms and then um, the money just uh, via bank transfer uh, is automatically in your bank account every month, um, so very easy. Um, one topic that is uh, very concerning to many people, even without families, um, moving to Germany is the language. I'm here more than four years and I still speak very basic German. I understand a lot, but I can't speak that well. Um, so I would say the earlier you can start exposing yourself to the language and learning is better um, for you and for the kids. Um, with kids, there are many, many different options. Um, a lot of the shows and movies and books that they know in their in your native tongue um, is also available in German. So you can start with that. Um, after you move, uh, you can use picture cards. Uh, the example here that I gave is something that we did for our daughter. She started um attending daycare when she was eight, 18 months old so she already was speaking uh hebrew words but the educators in the daycare don't understand hebrew they understand german and spanish so they asked us to prepare some list of the words that she uses a lot so they can understand her so that is one example if the child is younger and to give to the educational team. Another example is for uh, slightly older kids, maybe um, kids that are already in school, is to make small cards for them that they can show their teachers, for example, if they are thirsty, if they are hungry, if they need to call home, if they don't feel well, they need to go to the toilet, just the basic things to help them feel um, more understood. Um, and after you move, uh, just continuing to expose yourselves and your kids to the language any way you see fit and is good for your family. It can be a German speaking babysitter or play dates with other kids uh, from their school or their um, kindergarten. And of course, afternoon activities. And the most important thing. I think to understand is that um, learning a new language takes time. Um, kids do it faster than adults um, and they adapt to it uh, quicker, but still every child will react to the situation a bit differently. It also depends on what age um, they are, if they're moving when they're older or when they're uh, younger. and. Um, but they can feel frustrated um, when they feel misunderstood or confused if they don't understand what is happening around them. And we just need to give them time and trust them to get through this process um, the best that they can. Um, the other side of the same coin is maintaining our mother tongue in my case, and I know some of yours is uh, Hebrew. Um, so the general recommendation that I always hear and read about is to continue to communicate to them in the language that, uh, that feels most natural to us. Um, it also represents our culture, that's our humor, that's our holidays, that's our songs and books, everything is um, in Hebrew in our home. 
of course, there are German words that find their way into our conversation. And um, we also speak a lot of English with other people. So it kind of gets all mixed up. But still, the base of our communication is and will probably always will be Hebrew. Um, the podcast that you see here, My Bilingual Family, I really recommend it. If bilingualism and multilingualism is something that is interesting to you, um, it's an Australian podcast and I found it very insightful. And of course, there are, uh, you can see some examples here on how, how to uh, maintain the Hebrew or whatever language you speak at home. Um, to keep it alive uh, for your children because the, the older that they get and they start school and they start learning to read and write in German, then the mother tongue sometimes gets left behind. So there are many ways to keep it fresh in their minds um, through friends and activities and of course uh, books and music. The next big topic is the daycare and school system. Um, of course, Germany, like Germany, it's a bit complicated. Um, so I will try to simplify everything uh, for you. I don't know how old your kids are. Um, so we will start with the younger ones. Um, the first term that you should start to be familiar with is Kita. It's the most used word for um, kindergarten, daycare, um, preschool. Um, in German, it's Kita, and that's the word that you will see in all the Facebook groups and all the websites and all the information. Um, so that's very important. Um, in general, um, I hear a lot of people asking about the public versus private um, sc uh, school systems. Uh, because sometimes in their home country, the public system uh, has a very bad reputation. Um, but in Germany, that's not really the case. Um, most of the kids attend the um, public system and kitas are sometimes fully and sometimes partially subsidized by the state. Um, the amount that every family has to pay for the kita per month is uh, different between the different German states. For example, here I live in Berlin, so here we pay uh, 23 euros, I think, per child per month, which is basically only for the meals. Um, but I know that in other areas, uh, families pay a little bit more and it sometimes depends on the income of the parents. That all is determined in the Kita Gutschein, which is the next um, German term that you should know. Um, it's the voucher that you get from uh, the state, uh, stating uh, how many hours per day your child can attend Kita and how much if uh, you need to pay. And that is something that um, all kitas require before you register. Um, we will talk about it in a little bit. Um, just some general facts on the preschool system here. So we are not really talking about birth and pregnancy in Germany, but just something you should know is that the uh, uh, parental leave here is between 12 and 14 months and therefore most kids start attending Kita when they are one and if you don't move or anything life-changing major happens they can attend the same Kita until they go to school which is at six or seven years old. Um, Something that you can ask when you visit the kita before the child starts is how uh, they distribute the kids to different groups, age groups. Uh, sometimes it's smaller groups of kids with uh, similar ages. Sometimes it's one large group with uh, mixed ages. It can vary between the different kitas. Um, 
of course, there are many alternative kitas, uh, Montessori, um, Waldorf that you probably know. Uh, Forest Kita is a very sweet concept um, that they, the kids actually spend most of their days in the forest outside, no matter the weather, <laughs> um, which is weird for me, but kids love it. Um, there are bilingual kitas that are um, mostly not private, they are part of the public uh, sector. Um, for, for example, my daughter goes to a German-Spanish kita and there are also German-Hebrew kitas, or German-English, and etc. Um, another thing to consider for the younger kids until three years old in the most part is the Tagesmutter, or sometimes it's a Tagesvater. Um, which cares for kids in smaller groups, only usually only about to five kids. Um, so it's much, much smaller. Um, so for some families, that is a better option. And another thing to consider is that the acclimation process for kids in a new kita can be long. It's usually at least a month and sometimes much, much longer. Um, it's very child-led, so um, they see, the educators see how the child is responding to the kita, to the transition, to the separation from the parents, and um, if they are uh, experiencing difficulties, then it could take a long, long time. So if you're planning to start a new job or something like that, and that's something to consider that you will need to um, be more present during uh, that process. Just uh, one, one sentence is that when, when we're talking about acclimation process, it's basically saying that you're not putting the child for the whole day or for like the full time yeah. in the Kita, but rather it's, it's just something, it, it um, gets longer during uh, this uh, one or one and a half months period. So it starts with an hour or two and then it can get longer. But this is why we're mentioning that maybe you should not, uh, you know, put your calendar already full <laughs> during this time. So Yeah, exactly. Each Kita can do it a little bit differently, but basically I can say like from uh, my son, for example, he started Kita when he was one. And the first week I was there with him uh, for a few hours. And then the next week we started separation and it really started with five minutes and then seven minutes and then 10 minutes and then 15 minutes. Wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it took us six weeks to get to a full day, including the both meals and the nap. So yeah, it can be very uh, frustrating. And I know for some, families it takes much much longer oh, wow. um, but yeah with my daughter it was much shorter she went through it uh, easier um, there is a shortage of kita spots in almost all around Germany um, as far as I know especially for the younger kids because the groups are smaller and the uh, um, ratio between how many kids can be looked after by how many caregivers is um, fixed uh, by law so they can just accept uh, as many kids as they want um, what that means is that you need to start looking as early as possible so in some cases people start signing up to the waiting lists even before the baby comes um, and the waiting lists are very, very long, and it's not very regulated, which means that Akita is not obligated if a free spot is available. They're not obligated to contact according to the order of the list. They can do it however they see fit. So it's a lot of the times it's a matter of good timing and good luck. Um, if someone mentions to you that there is a free spot or you see it in a Facebook post or you called or visited the Kita 
at the right time, then you're lucky and sometimes it can really take a long, long time. Uh, for example, for us, when we looked for the first kita for my son, we contacted, I think, over 90 kitas. Uh, that's nine zero. <laughs> that's a lot. Um, and you really have to um, keep contacting them every few weeks. Um, so a few things on how to be more efficient in your Kita search is to write a nice letter in German. You can, of course, write it in whatever language and get it translated if you don't speak the language. Um, write a little bit about the, your children, your family, um, add a nice photo. Um, you should write, for example, what you do uh, uh, in your professional life. Uh, where do you live, uh, where you come from, if you speak German at home or not. That, uh, that's all information that the Kitas are interested in. Um, and then use, there are all these lists online. In Berlin, there is the Kita Navigator, which is relatively new, um, that is trying to bring all this Kita madness into order. <laughs> Um, so use one of those lists. Um, you can filter according to your uh, zip code or address um, or other things that are important to you and then create a list of the potential kitas where you could try to apply um, and put it all in a file, like an Excel file or something like that that can help you um, keep track of uh, who you contact and like I said you can you should follow up every few weeks um, so that they will remember you that they know you are still looking that it's still relevant um, and maybe you'll get lucky that way um, there's also the option because it's such a big problem um, there is the option to hire someone to do that for you. There are, I know in Berlin, certain services that offer that. And that's what we did when we changed uh, Kitas last year. Um, if you're too busy, it's really a lot. It can be a full-time job to look for a Kita spot. So if you're too busy to do that and you're insecure with the language or whatever reason, that's something you can, uh, you can do. Um, yeah, so that was for the little ones. Um, now we're going to uh, talk about the school system. Um, so an important thing that you should be aware of is that the compulsory education law um, is uh, for kids starting uh, six years old, um, which means that attendance is mandatory um for example homeschooling is not allowed for kids uh, six years and older um, and also if you want to take a vacation for example outside of the uh, official uh, holidays um, you need to ask for special permission and it's not always granted uh, it needs to be um, a very special occasion that they will um, allow it um, as opposed to kitas, where you can look all over the city, wherever um, you want, the schools are automatically assigned to you based on your address. Um, if for whatever reason you want a different school, if you heard another school is better or that the assigned school is not so good, if most of your kids' friends, for example, go to another school or they offer a certain uh, curriculum that you feel it better suits you and your family and your kids, um, then you could ask for a transfer. Um, what is uh, the best thing to do is to first uh, enroll to the assigned school that uh, you get assigned to automatically and then apply for a transfer. Um, and just know that it, it's not always granted. Um, there's also a lot of information online on how to best fill out the form, which is very, very German. <laughs> um, um, 
in addition to the um, public schools, there are, of course, uh, private schools. Um, the one thing to mention is uh, the international schools that I know that many expats and international families are interested in because of the um, openness to uh, foreigners and because English is the official language. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to attending an international school. Um, one is um, the language. The official language in uh, public schools is German, and then other languages are taught as uh, second or third languages, such as uh, English or French or whatever language. In international schools, the official language is English, and German is a second language, which is which could be convenient for us if we don't speak German. But if you plan to relocate for a longer period of time, then maybe that's not the best option uh, for kids who really want to integrate better into the German society. One, one sentence extra about that. Um, first of all, um, with regards to the question that came up, um, the international schools are usually private, which means um, they're not part of the um, public school systems, um, this one thing. And the other, um, maybe something, another thing to think about is that usually they don't have a teacher that escorts them for um, like a long period. So even the teachers could be teachers that are there for a year or two, um, which is uh, not the case with the public uh, school system, which they have a teacher that is um falling with them um through higher classes as well mm. yeah um okay if you have kids that are already in school and you're moving to germany and they don't speak the language uh, that is a question that comes up a lot so what happens is they should start with uh, what is called here a uh, willkommen klasse which means that they are not automatically integrated into their uh, peers who already can speak German. They need to learn the language first. So it's like an integration class um, that um, teaches uh, the language uh, very, very intensively. Um, one thing to know is that not all schools offer that type of class. In Berlin, a lot of schools do but it really depends on where you move and how many foreigners are in your area. Um, so that's something to um, check in advance before you decide which school to enroll to. Um, like I said, the official language in all the schools is German. So uh, for example, in the Kita, if the educator can speak English, they will have no problem communicating with you in English. But in the school system, it's different. And even if the teacher or the principal or the counselor or whoever, even if they know English, they can't basically uh, speak it with you and they will speak German. So um, you could um, use the services of a translator uh, to come with you to the meetings and even during the um, enrollment process. Um, schools are open usually for half a day, that's until one and a half in the afternoon. And younger kids can apply for the halt, which means they can stay until four. Um, and that's also part of the good shine. Um, like we said, for the kitas, you fill out the form and then you get the good shine for the hot. It works uh, very similarly. Um, this is where the Germans love for complicated uh, systems come into place um, in the school uh, system and uh, especially in the secondary school. 
as you can see in the illustration, all kids start uh, at the Grundschule, which is the elementary school, until they uh, finish fourth grade. That's for all the kids in all of Germany. Very simple. But then uh, the plot thickens, and uh, depending on where you live, you can choose between three or five different types of uh, secondary school. Um, they vary in the type of diploma that they offer in their curriculum, which means which classes are offered, um, and even the amount of school years it takes for a child to graduate. You can see here, for example, in the Hauptschule, which is on the left, um, a child graduates after year 10, which is, I think, around uh, age 16. And in the gymnasium, they uh, stay until they're 18 or 19. Um, it takes longer to graduate. Um, for example, the, uh, the most talked about and sought after diploma is the Abitur. Uh, which is required for university and not all schools offer the preparation for that. Um, <clears throat> what happens basically after the uh, is that during fourth grade um, uh, the children are separated to the different types of schools according to how they perform academically how it was in the past and still in the present in some places in Germany is like this very basic uh, separation into low abilities, medium abilities or high abilities, um, which is a lot of pressure to put on a fourth uh, grader. Um, and today the um, German school system is very infamously known for its tracking and the social inequality that it brings up. Uh, that is why a few years ago they issued a reform in some of the states to allow for more equal and better opportunities for all families. Um, because one example that um, is important for all of us who are listening to this now is that uh, children of immigrant families are more likely to perform uh, lower than their German classmates because they don't speak German at home, because they moved when they were older and they had to, to learn the, la the language um, later. Um, so, and in the past, um, moving, uh, transitioning from one school to another was very, very difficult. So if you start, for example, the gymnasium at fifth grade, you move on and you finish the gymnasium. You can't really transfer from another school to the gymnasium. Um, and that could um, basically change your entire education, higher education and um, limit the, your choices in terms of your occupation in the future. And that's all based on how well you performed in fourth grade, um, which sounds crazy, but that's the situation here. Um, so you will probably hear everyone talking about the gymnasium. Uh, that's uh, most parents uh, wish that their child will go to the gymnasium. Um, what it basically uh, set, what basically sets it apart from the other uh, schools is that it's designed to prepare the students for higher education. Um, in terms of what they learn, but also in terms of how they learn. It's very demanding. Uh, it can be very competitive and very stressful, even starting for the younger kids who are uh, 10 or 11 years old. Um, so sometimes, even if your kid performs well in school, gets good grades, maybe the gymnasium isn't the best place for him or for her because they won't um, 
be able to cope with that uh, stressful environment. Um, one thing to note is that in Berlin, there is the option to start the gymnasium in the seventh grade based on the grades of uh, grade six. Um, and sometimes a kid will be better prepared for the gymnasium when they're a little bit more mature. Um, some of you asked about special needs. Uh, that is something that is very dear to my heart because my son is autistic. So I have a lot of information on the topic. Um, I won't go deeply into the subject, but in general, what you should know is that most kids will integrate into the regular school system, both in the Kita and in school. There are special needs uh, kitas and schools, but it's only for the more uh, severe cases. Um, uh, so, for example, most autistic or ADHD kids or even Down syndrome or other special needs will integrate into the regular system. Uh, in the kita, the term that you should know is integration status. Um, which means that a child um, is entitled for extra support um, and the Kita gets more funding to provide him with that support. And in the school, you need to know the SEBUS, which stands for what you can see here, <laughs> School Psychology and Inclusion Educational Advice and Support Center. <laughs> um, which basically means that all the services um, that are provided for the special education are uh, supported by them. So the first, um, the first place you should reach out to if that is relevant to you is the CBUS in your, uh, CBUS in your area. Um, again, not all uh, facilities can offer the special education support, for example, my son was registered in certain kita, but after his diagnosis, they said they can't uh, give him the care that he is entitled for because they don't have uh, an educator that specializes in uh, special needs. So we had to look for a new uh, kita for him. Now we take a breather <laughs> after all of that. Uh, um, com uh, German complexity and speak about uh, what to do after school or uh, on the weekends. So there are of course many, many options. In Berlin, for example, because it's such a, a, it's a place that attracts people from all over the world that you can find classes and um, um, places to go that are in all languages. Here I listed just a few. There are music classes in English. Um, there is a Familingua that is an online school for bilingual kids uh, that kids can attend uh, from all over Germany, uh, which is a very nice concept. Um, if your kids are uh, younger and you are still responsible for their social calendar, then you should know that play dates are usually scheduled in advance. Um, sometimes you won't even have the phone number or the email of the other parents to contact them to schedule. So uh, what you will have to do is write a little note and put it uh, in the kita, in the cubby uh, of the other kid where they change their clothes and shoes and the other parents will see it and then they will write you back. So it takes a few days. So you can usually schedule like for the week after or even later because Germans love to plan ahead. Um, there are many face groups Facebook groups in all languages for activities. Um, in Berlin, there is a newsletter that you can sign up uh, for free with uh, everything that the city has to offer for kids uh, every weekend. 
Um, Himbel that you can see here in the bottom in pink, they also have a really nice calendar with different activities for kids. And there are many blogs and social media profiles like mine with um, ideas on what to do um, and recommendations and um, nice uh, cafes and restaurants and every, every family friendly place that we come across and we would love to post about. And um, like our last topic for today is uh, support and community. Um, most of us move here and we don't have our family and we need to start building our community from scratch. Um, and it can get sometimes difficult and sometimes lonely. Um, but the upside is that there is a lot of uh, support between the expat and international families because all of us are going through more or less uh, the same uh, situations. So there is a real sense of community within those groups. Um, there are, of course, uh, services for hire. Um, and there are a lot of online platforms that can help you with different things. Until very recently, I was a part of uh, It's July, for example, which is a matchmaking platform for families um, from all over the world. You can join and look for families when you travel, but also uh, just in your neighborhood to be open to meet new people, which is a very lovely concept. There's Buka Local, which is also uh, nice for people who don't speak the language. You can use it to find someone to help you uh, with translation or interpretation uh, for meetings and such. Um, and there are really nice uh, volunteer organizations too that are uh, specifically relevant for actually it's for mothers, uh, which are uh, super mamas, that it's like a mothers helping mothers uh, system. A more experienced mother can come to visit a new mother who just gave birth maybe and needs uh, the conversation and the support and the food. Um, I participated in that uh, only one time uh, until now, but it was uh, really, uh, really a nice experience. And there's La Leche League, which is, exists in many different countries, um, which helps uh, new mothers with uh, breastfeeding challenges and also offers a lot of free advice. Um, and I think that's it. So now we are open to questions. Wow, wow. that was uh, obviously a lot of information. Um, I, I will give you uh, a few minutes to digest <laughs> everything that you've just seen. Um, and you can definitely use the chat option now for asking more questions that may have arise during, uh, during the explanation or maybe are uh, arising now. And we will start first with what already is in the chat, um, which the first one is um, in the, let's, let's talk about the Kita and also in the school systems. Um, if it is possible to um, add the kids to the school or to the kita uh, during the school year um, or let's say in any given time or do you have to wait to schools to start? Um, yeah, let's talk about that. Okay, so let's separate it into kitas and schools. Uh, it's actually easier in schools because of the uh, compulsory education law. Um, the state is, uh, it's mandatory for the state to provide the kids with the, the school. Um, it may not be uh, the most, the school that is most uh, close to your home. Um, it may not be your first school of choice, but they are obligated to find you a spot. With the kitas, it's different. People can go for months and longer without a kita spot. Um, but if you do find a spot, you can start anytime, uh, unlike the school year, which, uh, 
is more uh, structured in the Kita. For example, the acclimation process can start whenever. Um, there are, of course, more places available uh, in the beginning of the year, which is August. Um, but even in the middle of the year, maybe a family is moving somewhere else and a place is available, then uh, your kid can potentially start immediately. Great. Um, all right, so we have another question, which is, um, what are the chances of getting into a higher education if, you, if the ch child is above uh, grade four? So that means basically, if I interpret the question is, um, what are the chances to go into gymnasium or maybe the um, Gesamtschule if um, you immigrate with a child who is higher is in a higher class than mm. so again my kids are not at that age but from what uh i know um they can start at the gymnasium they have to start uh, at another school like the gesamtschule um and then maybe ask for a special uh transfer um, but because they have to do the integration process and the willkommen klasse, um, that is not an option at the gymnasium. Yeah, um, I can add to that, if I remember correctly, the Gesamtschule is a, uh, a school that also allows you to do Abitur, which mm. means you don't have to go to the gymnasium in order to finish with this um, diploma that afterwards you need for uh, higher education um, and by the way also for um, getting accepted to jobs in many places and i also heard of the fact that you can even after finishing high school and even going into a higher uh, ages um, then you can also still do abitur in some special programs and special um, classes so it doesn't mean that if the child didn't do abitur in the gymnasium that then that's it yeah he their future no is whatsoever. no um, there are many other options it could just be that um, the time when the abitur will take place maybe be different than others. Um, but I know also of people who finished um, the one of the schools that, um, that, that finished before the age of 18 and then transferred to a gymnasium. So that can also happen. So there are varieties of options. It's just not as simple as just say, hey, we are here, uh, take us. Um, yeah, so don't, don't feel discouraged about that. Yeah, um, and also to say um, that the abitur is the abitur. It doesn't matter really where you did the preparation for it. Um, the universities will look at your tests and they don't really, it doesn't matter to them if you did it in the gymnasium or some other school or some other program. They just look at the abitur as is. Right. Um... All right, so that about this topic, we also have the question about health systems when it comes to kids and adults, um, cost efficiency and so on. Uh, maybe you can start and I will <laughs> add what I know uh, about uh, family life. Yeah, sure. I, I, let's just, I will give just a, a very short touch about this topic because it, we can go very deep into um, the health system, which I am planning also to have a webinar about. So if you want to um, stay tuned about it, uh, you can sign to the newsletter. Um, but just in general, in, gen in Germany, you have the um, public system, the public health system, and the private health system. Uh, I won't touch much about the private health system because this is very particular into what is the reason that you would want to um, use it. But most people are in the public systems, and um, especially if you are uh, an employee here, it's kind of a mandatory thing. Um, but um, it differs from maybe other countries when it comes to public systems um, because it offers everything. Actually, this is the most preferred um, situation to be in a public health system because um, it definitely um, gives the opportunity to do many, many types of um, 
um, let's say, tests and um, care that you can have under this umbrella of um, the health system. It, um, it could be expensive, but since it is deducted from the salary, it's not something that you need to really focus and think about. Um, but because it is a, a family uh, health system, that means also that children go um, under the, the payment of uh, the parents, basically, if I remember correctly, correct me if I'm wrong. It's also the case if only one of the, um, the couple, one from the couple is working and the other doesn't, you can also register under the working partner. So that also goes from for the children. Mm -hmm. um, but were you happy, let's say, from uh, you, you gave birth in Germany and also in uh, like the whole um, later care system for the children? Were you happy about it? Yeah, so we were told before we moved that for families, the best option is the public insurance. And my husband looked for work before we relocated to make sure that we were eligible for the public insurance. Um, I actually have, I mean, of course, you can talk about uh, certain doctors or waiting times or different things, but all in all, we are very happy. Um, and let's say that during the short time that we were here, we needed the health insurance on many, many different occasions, both for two births and uh, surgeries and also, you know, the regular things. And uh, yeah, the coverage is everything that we need. Yeah. So um, this is something that would be quite different than maybe other countries. So this is definitely something you can think about. Um, all right. So as I see, there are no more questions. Um, I would like to thank Ofri again for coming and from giving from your spare time and from the vast um, variety of your knowledge uh, to everybody. And I am definitely um, happy to, to have you back and uh, hopefully we can uh, do that maybe next time as well, um, with maybe, maybe other topics, but I think this definitely helps a lot um, to, to just understand what is it like to be a parent in Germany, which as we mentioned, maybe in some points can be a little bit tricky, <laughs> um, but it's not to say do do it or don't do it. It's just, it is always best to have every decision as a wise decision uh, with some knowledge before. So exactly. with um, all the information. With all the information, exactly. So um, thanks again. Uh, we would love to have your feedback um, if you are watching it online and online, if you're watching it, uh, sorry, um, if you're watching it from YouTube later, or if you are watching now, we would definitely love to get your feedback on uh, the topic. And if you want to join other webinars about other topics about moving to Germany, um, you can use uh, the new letter through um, this website you are in through. And uh, me and Afri are wishing you a very nice weekend, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Aden. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.